Thank you. Um, welcome to today's Transportation Town Hall, hosted by State Representative and Speaker of the House, Julie McCluskey, along with State Senator Mark Baisley. My name is Rob Green. I'm the President of the Chamber, Platte Canyon Area Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber, I'd like to welcome you both to Bailey, um, where we are mountain strong together. And also want to thank you for, con for conducting this Transportation Town Hall. Um, I also want to acknowledge the other elected officials in the room. We have the three Board of County Commissioners for Park County, um, Commissioners Dick Elsner, Amy Mitchell, and Dave Whistle. And we also have our Park County Assessor, Monica Jones. Yeah. So we've got a packed house of elected officials today. Oh, yeah. awesome. And on a Saturday, no, lie, no doubt. Um, our state representatives heard us loud and clear last year about all of our 285 and transit issues here in Bailey. Um, they have brought along representatives from CDOT who are well aware of our recent truck rollovers at the bottom of Crow Hill. <clears throat> we are not here today to rehash what has happened in the past. CDOT is here today to talk about the future. What They want to talk about our 285 transportation needs and discuss and share their 10-year plan. Um, Speaker McCluskey and Senator Baisley will be answering um, questions after the presentations by CDOT. Um, there are some ladies that are walking around, our volunteers, who have cards and pens for you to write down your questions um, that, will, that you will then turn back into them. Um, that they will give to the uh, speaker and the senator um, during Q&A. Um, so all the questions have to be written, so please um, write your question and hand them to one of the volunteers. And at this juncture, I'm going to say let's turn it over and welcome Speaker McCluskey and Senator Woo! Pete Bates. Thank you, Rob, and uh, really glad to see so many um, of the Park County residents here today so that we can have a conversation about an issue that I know is certainly a priority for all of you because I heard about it every time I visited Park County, Bailey area particularly. And coming from Summit County, where I currently live, I'm on the I-70 corridor and transportation woes and concerns are a big priority for us there as well. Um, I am Julie McCluskey. I am currently the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I, uh, thank you. It is a, a true honor and privilege to serve as the first woman from the Western Slope as Speaker of the House. Um, and I am really proud that in my district, six counties, um, not only Western Slope counties, but also part of our beautiful rural Arkansas Valley and uh, the, the gorgeous South Park, um, I have that opportunity to lift up and prioritize rural issues in the legislature. We know that transportation has been a big priority in the state. Our crumbling roads and bridges have been a priority for legislators for the entire time I've served and certainly for time before. And while we've been able to bring tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars to this need over the past few years with very significant legislation, we know that those dollars need to get out into communities, start addressing some of the transportation challenges we are facing um, in a much more direct and expedited way. Um, I'm excited that friends of ours from CDOT are here today to talk about the unique challenges we face here in Bailey, particularly with 285. Uh, I know, living in Summit County, we've seen a lot more folks coming up to visit our beautiful high country. And I, unfortunately, I think many of you are dealing with those skiers when they are coming home on a Sunday afternoon. Um, oh, good, yeah, get a note on that one. Um, I face that kind of traffic on the I-70 corridor as I'm going back and forth to Denver, but I know that that volume I've, I've seen, that increase, is certainly one that you must be feeling here. And I've heard it from residents, and I know it is something that we have got to address. So I hope today's conversation can really be one first of listening and learning, 
a chance for all of you to hear from CDOT representatives what their priorities are, what's ahead for us in the 10-year plan in this particular region. I'm very pleased to say that Lisa Hickey, Transportation Commissioner, has also joined us from this area. Thank you. And so we will have that moment, listen, learn, and then share perspectives. I want to make sure that all of you have a chance to have your voice heard in what you're concerned about, what we need to address at the General Assembly, and how we make sure we're ensuring safety on the roads here in your community. Um, I also am very pleased that Senator Mark Baisley has uh, joined us today. I'm sure he wants to share a few words as well. Senator Baisley um, has graduated to the Senate. He left me behind in the House. Uh, we, we had the honor of serving the past four years together. His district looked a little bit different, as did mine. Uh, but with redistricting, we now share not only Park County, but Chafee County and Lake County. So we're going to have the opportunity, I hope, to host many more town halls on a variety of issues here in Bailey, in Fair Play, as well as I hope Guffy at some point, um, <laughs> to make sure that we're covering all of Park County. But Senator Baisley, a few words. Thank you. Thank you. I've long wondered why they left out the S in the name Bailey. I've always wondered that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's a real joy to, always has been, an honor to, to work with uh, Julie McCluskey. Isn't that amazing that your your state representative is also Speaker of the House? Yeah. Woo! I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, think of the honor. I said this to her uh, shortly after she she was uh, given that distinction, and I said, "You're third in line after the the Lieutenant Governor." She's like, "Stop it! I got enough." <laughs> <laughs> It really, truly is an overwhelming, and uh, but anyway, but but no one better. I, in serving with her, um, I even shared with her. Uh, uh, she probably remember this from like probably a year and a half ago, um, in one of the year-round committees on education that we were serving together. And I said, um, you know what? If I were a Republican Speaker of the House, um, I would have a hard time not assigning you as a committee uh, chair because she really. She really runs that uh, an organization very well. So uh, uh, we are all well served with with uh, Julian McCluskey as Speaker of the House. Um, uh, what was I going to say here? First of all, let me say um, all all the uh, commissioners. Great to see you. Um, all good friends. Uh, two of you, two of you, uh, Dick Elsner and uh, Amy Mitchell. I've known for probably 15, 20 years uh, uh, working with them in other capacities. Um, and I'll just leave you with just this. Uh, there are a few things I believe that government ought to be doing in our lives and having authority over our lives, but transportation, the infrastructure of roads, is one of those that I think does make sense for us to, to delegate to government, and we ought to do it well. So um, I'm very pleased that this is a CDOT-oriented meeting, and I'm appreciative that uh, I get to, to represent you all in the, in the Senate. It's a true honor. And uh, let me just step aside and let the real show begin. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to invite now Shane Ferguson, who is the Region 2 Transportation Director. And he is going to uh, start with a brief introduction and also introduce all of our CDOT representatives here today. Thanks, Shane. All right. Well, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for inviting us here. I appreciate that. We're excited to talk to you uh, just about the, uh, the improvements that we're planning for, man, just this next year. You guys will see quite a bit happening, as well as the years to come. Um, I brought along with me uh, Transportation Commissioner Lisa Hickey, who I'd like to invite up now just to speak a little bit. And then also I've got uh, my traffic engineer, Jason Nelson, who I'll uh, have come up here in just a little bit as well. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to hearing from you. My name is Lisa Torman Hickey. I am your Transportation Commissioner. I serve Park, Teller, Fremont, and El Paso counties. That's uh, District 9. I've been on the commission for two years. Just last month, I was very pleased to move a budget amendment where we approved new funding to uh, rebuild the intersection between 285 and 90 in Fair Play. 
We are very interested in this region and what we can do to improve it. To put the money to work that Representative McCluskey uh, noted has been approved for CDOT over the last couple of years. We are actively putting that money to work. It takes time to roll out. Uh, Shane will talk about the 10-year plan that we've approved recently and the provisions that we've made for this area. So we will look forward to your questions and from hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's just jump in. Um, and so I'm going to bring in Jason Nelson, who's my traffic engineer, and he's going to speak to you about Bailey as well as the intersection at 43. Good afternoon, good, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what, I, what I'm here to talk to you guys, oh, a little closer. Okay, and I'm a mumbler. Uh, all right, I'll do my best, just keep giving me that. All right, all right, I got it, thanks guys. So I'm here to talk to you kind of about our upcoming project here. And so at the Below Crow Hill, we are doing a safety project where we're going to install median barrier throughout the proper town of Bailey, I call it, where all the commercial buildings are. We're also going to install guardrail along the, the riverside on the south side. And so we have some other minor signing improvements going down Crow Hill. So uh, we're hoping to get that project out to uh, advertisement in April, and hopefully we can start construction in the summer. And so that's kind of my big update. We um, I do want to say thank you to all your county commissioners. They really helped to accelerate this project and kind of get the last bit of string of funding we got. I do want to thank Rob because we did, uh, he did host our, the project website. It is on the, um, your website? Yes. Okay. Facebook. It's on your Facebook? Well, it's on, it's on Facebook. Okay. But we also, I do also have postcards. And next door. And, okay, it's on next door also. But I do have postcards for everyone where you can actually get to the project website, look at the plan sheets, and there's also a, an area to put comments or questions. So I look forward to the feedback. Oh, so we will, okay. I, he did say 43, and I, and I kind of glazed over it. <laughs> I'm so happy half the, the room laughed. That was good. I still didn't get them. I tried. <laughs> no, um, we're still monitoring that intersection and you know keeping an eye on it. Uh, currently, we have no plans to move forward with the removal of the signal, but it is something we're, we're going to continue to look at and watch. Yeah. And again, at the end, we'll have time for Q and A in case some of the questions that you guys have. Perfect. Yeah. All right. How's that? Yeah. All right. Outside place. Um, yeah, at the end, we'll definitely have the Q&A, specifically if you guys have additional questions that you'd like to hear about um, regarding that location in Bailey, as well as anything else that I kind of go over um, this afternoon. Um, I do want to talk about kind of our next project in the area, and it's the US 285 and 9 intersection in Fair Play. Um, I'm happy to say that it is awarded to a contractor um, about $30 million worth of work. And that price, as you guys are familiar with, of course, in our own homes and our own budgets, has escalated quite a bit, right? Um, just to give you an example of what we're looking at, some of the challenges that we're looking at at CDOT, is about two years ago, for asphalt, we were looking around $70 to $80 a ton. And I believe for the US 285 and 9 location, we're going to put down close to 20,000 tons of asphalt, just along 9 as well as 285 corridor. So you can just figure up the numbers yourself how much that would be. We're looking at prices now, just because of oil, petroleum, shipping costs, trucking costs, etc. We're looking at we're looking at numbers of 150 to 200 dollars a ton. Um, and so those are just a magnitude of cost, magnitude challenge, almost double or over double of what we're seeing in, in some of the price increases across the board. And so that gives you a picture of some of the challenges that we were having to deal with. Our budgets haven't changed. Our budgets are very much the same, but we are trying to make do with what we have. So to talk a little bit more about that intersection, um, I know at one time there was discussion of a roundabout there. That is not happening. That went away years ago. Um, but what we will be doing, so you know 
the bridge that is just south of that intersection, right? That's a constriction point that really constricts what we can and cannot do at that location. We're replacing it. You will see a brand new bridge as part of this project. Um, and it will be quite a bit wider. We're going to include sidewalk as well as a trail underneath that bridge to connect that, we'll call it east and west side of 285, as well as pedestrian crossings and a signal, uh, pedestrian signals at the intersection. Um, we're increasing the number of left turn lanes. Currently you have one left turn lane. It's going to be two left turn lanes to go from the northbound direction to the westbound direction, if you will. Um, similar, similarly, from 9 coming, I'd say, eastbound to northbound, so if you're coming back from Breckenridge and going to Denver, we're adding another left turn lane there as well. And we're going to take that left turn lane up north, um, or the, the dual lanes north on 285, so you have plenty of room for people to get back into a single lane. We're going to improve the drainage in the corridor, and we're adding sidewalks along that corridor as well on 285 and 9. Um, so as you're coming back, and I know one of the challenges that we have at that location is as you're coming to the eastbound direction going southbound, you know, it's a real tight turn in acceleration, right? That's going to be improved quite a bit. We're extending that acceleration down quite a bit once we've widened that bridge. Um, again, it's about a $30 million project in that community. And um, we're hoping to break ground in April or May of this spring. And so we're excited to have the contractor on board. It will be two seasons, and so there will be two years of disruption in that community. And I'm sorry to say that, but that's, that's going to be a lot of construction work. We're building a brand new bridge, and we're going to have to phase that construction um, appropriately to keep everybody safe. Um, this summer, likely what you will see is on the east side, the bridge will be built. Right? No, I'm sorry. The west side, the bridge will be built by itself. And so kind of offline, if you will. And so not a whole lot of disruption on 285 this summer along that bridge corridor. You'll see quite a bit probably the winter, spring, and summer next year's worst disruption on 285. And so just to prepare you of what's coming at that location, um, we're excited about the project. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be quite, a, quite an improvement um, for that piece of our corridor, and we're excited at CDOT just to see that finally be awarded and moving forward. Um, <clears throat> a couple other projects I want to talk about in our 10-year plan. Um, payment condition on 285. We know it's a challenge up and down the corridor. We do have two projects coming up. Um, the first one I'm looking at probably in calendar year 25, so a few years from now, we will do a surface treatment project for another 10 miles north of uh, Fair Play. If you remember, uh, the, I think it's mile marker 220, I believe is the number. Um, we're going to head north another 10 miles um, and resurface 285. Um, that's planned for calendar year 27. And then here in the Fair Play or the um, Bailey area, Brian, a few years after that, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm looking at planning it for 27, calendar year 27. Um, basically from Bailey all the way up to the county line, we'll be replacing the pavement uh, along that piece of the corridor as well. Both of those projects currently we're looking around 10 to 12 million dollars each is what the cost will be for those projects. And so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of future pavement projects. Um, currently we have a chain, chain up station that's been in construction on Kenosha Pass on the southbound direction of 285. Um, it's not complete. Um, we got a lot of it put down for the asphalt as well as the, the, the parking area. But we have a lot of ITS or, or um, equipment that still needs to go in um, for that location. And so you'll see some activity this spring finishing up that location. Um, a couple of other spots that we have planned for chain up stations. We have one, um, say State Highway 9 on this side of Hoosier Pass. Um, and I do not remember the exact location, but we'll just say the base of the mountain. Right? Um, that will go into construction this spring. Um, so we'll have another chain-up station on this side of Hoosier Pass. The other side, uh, on the, the town of uh, Silver... Blue River. Blue River, thank you. <laughs> All my community. So I, I, uh, I just became the region director about six weeks ago. And uh, I am figuring out all the different communities that, that I serve. And so it takes a little bit of time. So forgive me if I get some names mixed up. But Blue River, we have another planned chain-up chain station at that location in that area. 
Um, we're working with the community. Um, we'll see how that develops as it as it moves along. There's definitely challenges that we come across on every project we have, and it's definitely going to be one where we can, we're going to continue to work with the community, see if the site is appropriate, see if we can come up with a solution that works for the community as well as the needs that we have. Um, you get a lot of the truckers coming over that pass, and currently what the, what they're doing, right, if they're not pulling off in at some other location on State Highway 9, they get as far as they can on 9, and then they stop in the middle of the pass, and they chain up. And if you're in the middle of a, one, a, a snowstorm that you guys see incredibly, numerous times around here, right, it's incredibly dangerous for them, for our traveling community, for our CDOT folks, our snowplow drivers that drive that pass in the worst of conditions. And so we would like to continue to move forward with these chain up stations, just as a safety precaution for the community as well as the people that drive that corridor. Um, a, a, a recent success that we've had is a bridge replacement just south of Fairplay that was completed this past spring. Um, I believe we spent around $8 million on that bridge replacement. Um, if you drive it now, there's a little bit of a bump <laughs> that happens in construction. That's going to be fixed. Um, that is going to be eliminated and fixed. The, the, the bump is going to be gone, just in case there's anybody aware of that area um, this spring. So when it gets warmer and we get the pavement conditions um, back to normal, um, or the uh, temperature conditions back to normal, we are going to replace that bump, if you will. Um, I'm used to saying any questions right now, but I'll go ahead and let you guys write down. I, I know we have kind of a format that we're going with. Um, so I'll hold off my temptations, but we'll, we'll, we'll go. Um, Talk about Bailey, please. Thank you for the information on Fair Play. Yeah. So we did, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of rehash a little bit here with Bailey. Um, Mr. Nelson definitely talked a little bit about, about Bailey. We have a construction project that is planned to go to advertisement this April, okay? And so we're anticipating, fingers crossed with good bids from contractors, that we're going to go to construction um, June, July, sometime this summer, with a project where we will address adding concrete barrier, okay, concrete median barrier between the northbound and the southbound side um, to address that crossover along that curve and in that area, um, up and down Bay, up and down that, that 285 in Bailey. In addition to that, we're adding what you see along our highways, that WB, we call it W-beam guardrail. That's going to be alongside the river side of 285, um, just kind of help prevent that jumping into the river side of the, the, uh, of the corridor. And then lastly, on top of that, we are adding one of the large cantilever overhead signs um, um, uh, on the top of the hill, on the top of Crow Hill just warning the truck drivers, gearing down. Um, I don't know exactly the words. <laughs> it will be, I've had some suggestions as to what we would put up there, but um, I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Nelson on the exact wordage, um, and not Mr. Elsner. Um, um, and I believe we're also adding rumble strips along that, that corridor as well, in the center part. No. Um, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't believe any dirt turn lanes are. Well, I mean, um, come on up. Come uh, on up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're not doing a presentation, but there are going to be postcards with the project website in. So please, you know, go to the website, kind of take a look at it, because there is quite a few improvements that we're doing. And so there's a lot below Coral Hill, but on the hill and a little bit above it, we're doing signing and some. Some other changes that I think it's going to make a, a real big difference when it comes to safety. So I encourage everyone to look at that. And I think we're going to put the postcards probably on the table before yeah, everyone leaves. Oh, you got. Thank you, sir. So we're going to put the postcards out on the table where you got your name card. And so if you can pick it up and then just go to the project website and take a look at the plans. And if you have comments, please leave us a comment. It'll, you'll have that ability. Um, but Shane, you had it right. Uh, concrete, medium barrier, guardrail. Can you describe the guardrail? You gave a name, but I have no idea what that means. So, e engineers, I know. <laughs> 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 they're, structural engineers is worse, though. <laughs> they're the worst. So, uh, just don't ask us to spell. Public speaking is pretty rough for us. Mm -hmm. But um, 
We just call it a W rail. It's the metal guardrail that you see everywhere. That's going to be on the creek side and then the concrete kind of median barrier in the center. What's the height and median barrier? So it's mash compliant, so I think it's 36 inches tall. It's pretty robust. Yeah. Yeah, so what you see up and down the interstate, right? Um, the, the, uh, the aluminum barrier. That's going to be very similar. That's going to be along that side of, uh, of the river. And then what you see in the, on the interstate for the concrete barrier, very similar to what you'll see, what you'll see um, in the median or the middle part. I think they're called Jersey walls, right? Jersey so please, barrier. yeah, sir, Jersey barrier. Some people call them Jersey barrier, et cetera. Uh, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Slugs are having to reinforce the 36 inches with a truck packing that kinetic energy. Yeah. Right over the top of yeah. It, it, uh, you're upset. You're upset. Exactly right. Especially if you're doing perpendicular hits. You know, a lot of these hits um, are going to be grazing, right? As they're coming around that corner and down the hill. Yeah. So I think what you have in place will probably work pretty well. Yes, ma'am. Well, with that being said. If they hit that, that barrier, what about trying to village? Trying to village, trying to find all of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, what I, it's going to do, it's going to bounce up that. And yeah. Can anybody talk about that? Yeah. Uh, I would say that in some of those situations, you know, it's hard to control every, every situation without, you know, we don't want to put barrier up and down either side. Yes, sir. Um, and so, for right now, this is our solution that we have. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can, can I just ask um, why it's why you're waiting to do it? I know it's winter, yeah. but I'm. I mean, we've been waiting for like ten years. Yeah. So I know we started recently on that design this past fall. Um, and as far as the reason why it's been that long, I don't have an answer for you. I really don't. Um, but you are saying it will start this, this summer. summer it we will. will. Yes, it is going to start the construction. The construction will start this summer. Um, well, just one second. I have a great stack of cards for a lot of questions, and I want to make sure that both Shane and Jason have an opportunity to address those. Uh, Maya Taylor is passing out the postcard now that Jason referred to. That has specific information on the website. You can see, I assume, diagrams of the project and the plans for uh, completion. Great. Uh, please um, be sure to do that if you have additional questions on that project after reviewing the website. We can uh, take those questions either via our offices or I'm sure there is contact information on the website for you to reach out directly to CDOT. Um, I, I also want to address the waiting for 10 years. Um, I, Senator ba Baisley and I have been in office for four. Can you hear me okay? Um, and I will say for as long as I've been in office, there have been a lot of concerns about the number of projects that have not even made it onto the 10-year plan in this state. Our backlog of transportation projects four years ago was over nine billion and we had no ident identified resources to help accomplish those projects. Two years ago we passed legislation that will bring 5.4 billion dollars to our backlog but 5.4 billion isn't nine and so we are still trying to get more of our transportation projects on that fast track no pun intended so that they are in the hopper for completion. I will add that the investment, I always say this wrong, the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed at the federal level is bringing millions more dollars, 700 million more dollars to Colorado for projects in this state. One of the projects that has been awarded dollars from that pot has been the Floyd Hill project that I know has been on our lists for completion 
for more than two decades, if not longer. So I really appreciate that 10 year um, project question and frustration because I think we have a number of, of challenges in transportation that have been sitting on that list and have not made it to the 10 year plan mark. We have a lot of questions here and I'm gonna give Shane an opportunity to address those as well as Jason. So if you'll hang in there with me, we'll try to go through a few of these and be sure to circle back um, on any other questions that we haven't yet addressed. So first up, could a smart light be installed on Highway 285 and County Road 43? All right, Jason. <laughs> Woohoo! Should have all three of us. Come on up. Smart light at 43 and US 285. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's always, I, I kind of have to interpret what a uh, smart light means. So, uh, yeah, so in my mind, you know, it has kind of robust detection. It's always watching the side streets, the main line, and kind of watching when traffic comes and builds. And so that's exactly the system we do have. The only difference is we have really two major timing plans, kind of one for off season or summer and the one for the other times. And so the, the big difference between them is the amount of holes on the side street. So uh, you guys may notice that it gets a little bit longer, but we're... A lot longer. Right. <laughs> so the crash pattern we have there is rear ends because that light will cycle a lot. And so people stop and that leads to the, the, the accidents. So what we've done is we try to hold it a little bit longer. It, it, it does take a little bit longer to get through, but uh, the accidents have gone down quite a bit. So... I appreciate your patience. We we do things for you know a reason. It's hard to understand always, but that's kind of what it is. But so a smart light, we have one there. It's just the way we operate. It's a little bit unique for accidents. All right. Next question I have in front of me is: um, Are there any plans for barriers between north and southbound two eighty five? in the two and three lanes sections between Conifer and Bailey. I don't believe at this time we have anything planned in that piece of the corridor. Um, and then I do want to say real quick before we get to the next question um, on our transit services real quick. I want to hit upon that. Um, the governor um, in his uh, state of the state or his uh, acknowledged um, speech at the beginning of the season or beginning of January talked about a vision planning. Um, for transit and in, in throughout the state. And CDOT is beginning to look at what does that transit planning look like. And so there's going to be more to come, but we want to be sure that we're communicating with the, with our communities and, and, and reaching out as far as where the needs are. Um, and so that's just a, a initial beginnings for it right now, but uh, more to come on that one. We're going to be looking a lot more at our transit system within the state. Okay. All right, why isn't the 7% downgrade prohibited for 80,000 gross vehicle weight vehicles? Why are Jake brakes not restricted south of Crow Hill? Mr. Traffic Engineer, <laughs> I would say do not sit down. <laughs> this is your forte. So the first question, thanks. I, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> Please don't make fun of me. The girl in the front row can hold it for you. <laughs> um, so there are some unique, um, I call them CMV laws throughout the state, commercial vehicle laws. Um, the further west, we do have um, even restricted speed limits for based on grade and weight. Um, and that's really a legislative act, so we don't have it here. Um, so uh, if there was a law put in place, we would uh, definitely follow that. Um, but the second part, um, Jake breaks. So back in 1989, uh, federal law required all, you know, every commercial vehicle to have Jake brakes. And it's a, it's, a, it's a safety issue, right? Kind of, you know, reduces the wear on your brakes. And so we won't put up Jake brakes uh, are not allowed unless CSP puts, you know, puts the request to us. Um, what we have found in the past is if we prohibit Jake breaks, and, you know, and you still hear the Jake breaks, people will say, well, you know, CSB needs to, you know, go out and re enforce it. 
and they have very limited sound equipment. So unless they make the request to us, we, we won't put that burden on them because they're pretty understaffed and overworked right now. Very oh, Carl, Carl, yeah. no, it's uphill on that court. Why would you use Jake Brakes going up the hill? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so so south. Oh, south. 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 Dirt. Yeah. Okay. And, all right. Nope. Jason, stay up here. <laughs> <laughs> These are yours. I'm just going to read them to you since you're out of classes. All right. Uh, the mileage going from, and I'm saying the, uh, the posted speed going from 285 from the top of the hill to 40 miles per hour is 1.7 miles. Why 40 miles per hour? I guess the question is more about why do we have it posted at 40 miles per hour? Okay. So that, that, that's a great question and one we face a lot. And so, um, uh, see that follows kind of the federal guidance on how to set speed limits. That process is changing currently, so um, hold off on that. So <coughs> the way we do it is we kind of do a blind speed analysis, and so we'll not really hide in the bushes, but you know you're unaware that we're collecting speed data, um, and whatever the 85th percentile. So what that means is what the vast majority of people are driving at or below will become the posted speed limit. Um, and I think people are really shocked that's how we do the speed limit, but, well, I know, but that's how we maximize safety. So if we monitor what naturally people think they'll drive safely, uh, that's where we found we, we get the less accidents. Again, that process is changing. We're going to get some context sensitive uh, solutions to speed limits and maybe taking some other inputs to really decide a really good speed limit, but that's coming soon with the new update to the federal guidance. So I guess just a real quick follow on that. Can't you just get all that data off Google? I mean, mm -hmm. it, ma it monitors your cell phone through all that stuff. Yeah, so probe data is pretty good. There are some instances it doesn't work really well. And so what we found with probe data is, so if you have three people in the car, you'll get three data points. That can, if that happens over and over, you're really skewing the data. So to, depending on what you're trying to do, especially like a speed curve, if you, if you have, you know, 50 people in one car, that will drive the curve in a way. So we kind of like just doing, capturing the vehicles. That's a good point. Okay. Um, this next question um, is, the solution at Schaefer's Crossing seems to be a great fix. Admittedly, this is outside of our region. Jason, where are you going? <laughs> uh, uh, do you have stats on the improvement? Can you help me understand the person that wrote this question a little bit about what's the improvements that you saw? Yeah, so I know that uh, in my first 10 years here, mm -hmm. um, that whole area was kind of a death trap. And I'm curious to know, are there statistics on how that has improved? Because it certainly seems a lot safer, and I seem to see fewer accidents. Just wondering, do you have any stats on that? You know, that's a great question. And, and stats like that, I can try to find out, and we'll get back to you. I just don't have those in front of us, and so that's a great question. We're Maybe very I much want to say thank you. <laughs> I, I will definitely pass that on to the team. Um, but I do, since you mentioned Schaefer's Crossing, I do want to mention a little bit about outside of my region and area, which is Region 1. Um, they do have a plan in the 10-year plan as well um, to add four lanes as well as acceleration deceleration lanes from Richmond Hill to Schaefer's Crossing, um, as well as improving the interchange or an interchange there at uh, Kings Valley. Um, looking at that plan, it looks like it's probably going to be six around four to six to eight years out. Um, and just to give you an idea of the cost in that location as well, it's about $60 million currently budgeted for that project. So a little, little bit more to come in that, that location in particular. All right, we'll go ahead and the next question. So we've got a couple about driver education. All right. <laughs> okay, what can CDOT do to improve safety? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is the day, the name of the day, right? Um, and we spend a lot of money, and, and we can talk a lot about our budgets and what we do. We have a couple of major sources of funding, um, HSIP and FASTER. FASTER is part of your registration fees. Um, HSIP is a federal fee or federal um, contribution as well. 
Um, and we do everything from re uh, uh, reconstruction of curves to adding guardrail to the barriers to um, you name it. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can implement passing lanes, et cetera. We just did passing lanes. I say we just did. We did about four years ago just south of Fair Play, right? We added passing lanes at that location. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that we improve safety and that we try to improve safety. Um, education on that side of the house, I don't, you may have a little bit more information on how we educate or get out to the public through CSP or through the education system, but I know we, we, we make our efforts in that direction as well. No, Shane, that's great. Um, yeah, so we focus on the three E's at CDOT, you know, and what we really do control them, I think, a good job, given our funding limits is engineering. So the other component is enforcement and, and education. So we work closely with uh, local law enforcement and CSB. And um, on the education, we're really engaged with quite a few communities, uh, Bicycle Colorado, the MPOs, uh, and, the, and, you know, your, and your TPRs, they all kind of gather all your inputs, and uh, that's your planning region here. Um, so we do a really good job, I think. Uh, the education is something we don't, not directly in, but we do put our opinions in. So we provide a lot of current stats for community challenges for accidents, whether there's a defined pattern or location. So then we can kind of educate and do targeted communication. And I was trying to stall. I <laughs> <laughs> Nicely yeah. done. All right. Nice job. All right. Um, how to better curb excessive speed all along 285 highway. <laughs> Most accidents are caused by speed. Absolutely. And we see that across the state on all of our corridors. And it's definitely behavior, right? It's a lot of the behavior. It's, it's, that's a challenge. And CSP, I mean, it is enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. We at CEDA, we don't have that enforcement leg, right? It is our state patrol, it's the county, it's the local community's enforcement hand. But that is the best mechanism we have to curb speed. Um, and it is, it is a problem across it across the state as well. Um, runaway truck ramp. And so I'm going to guess this is this is with respect to Bailey. Is there an opportunity for a runaway truck ramp? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hit it briefly. I know my uh, counterpart here is way more familiar with that location as well. <laughs> but I believe that the planned location in the environmental document is, is not really a great location that would help for the situation. I think it's a little bit further up the hill than it would be needed or where it could be required or be beneficial, if you will. Um, I don't know if there's any other studies or anything that we've done for a runaway truck ramp for 285 or anything else you want to add to that one. No, no we looked at this one pretty closely because it is on the old 2006-2008 uh, environmental document. Uh, that was what it was slated for. We've kind of looked at the where the accidents are happening, where the crossovers are. Um, you, you do have some movement through the curb, and then they cross over, right? And if you look at the box truck that was four years ago, you know, they were kind of before, and, you know, that one we may have benefited. But the root cause of that accident was the driver was asleep. So, you know, the hill was a lot longer, and, you know, the topography was a lot different. We, you know, truck runaway ramp would probably be the standard treatment. So. Okay. A Bailey bypass per the 2002 vision statement. Um, you know, when we <laughs> when you talk about bypasses, right, um, there is a lot of economic potential economic impact to communities. And um, right now, at least on the seat outside of the house, there's nothing moving forward for a, a, a vision or a plan for a Bailey bypass. Um, that being said, you know, that's usually community driven. Um, and uh, I, I'm guessing that's probably not really something that would be desired in within the Bailey community. So I'll kind of leave that one alone. We're not, we're not moving forward with any sort of bypass in this community. I'll do that one. You do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought you could raise it. That one. Okay. We'll do this one at the end. Um, 
Can I ask a question? I don't, I don't, I don't have a little card to fill out, but I'd like to ask a question if I could. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious why you don't like use uh, J, J turns. Uh, you know, where, where there's uh, traffic cutting across two and three and four lanes of traffic, oftentimes you know you'll see people. Obviously, overpasses and underpasses are very costly, but there's you could have J turns that would uh, you know not as costly as the overpasses, but also eliminate having people come across four lanes of traffic. So I think the environmental document has quite a few of those built in, but they, not so much the J-term, but the under and overs, right? And so I think the long-term vision was kind of to mimic what Conifer has done kind of throughout town, specifically out here before the 72 interchange. There was quite a few of those. Right, but they're expensive to build. Yeah. Whereas J-turns are relatively inexpensive. You just send, the, the, instead of crossing over, you send them down the road a little bit and make them do a U-turn. Right. <clears throat> and they can be costly, depending on where you're at. Mountains, you don't see them too often. But I think what really, when you when you talk about some kind of movement like that, you got to look at the speed, right? And so this is a pretty high-speed corridor. Not everywhere is it posted high, but the average running speed's pretty high. I mean, some we, we do consider, but um, we, we haven't installed too many of those in the state. Well, typically the J-turn, you get off of the main road right, and, and then, then make a J-turn, you know, right. come back the other direction. Just, I know other states use it, you know, to solve their problems. We're putting one in springs, and it, it costs quite a bit, right? And especially up here, I, I just don't see the opportunity without costing it. Thank you. All right. A question asked is, can we get a pedestrian bridge in downtown Bailey? Um, <laughs> Those are usually community driven, and I would say that is definitely an extremely high cost, right? I mean, we don't, for, for our side of the house, um, unless it's community driven and, and, and desired to move forward, we don't usually program in that type of uh, improvement. Um, and again, looking at the cost that we have um, for construction, just for our highways, et cetera, it seems we are, for, we are facing quite a few challenges of what we can deliver as it is with our, with our current plan and our cur current budgets. So, um, all right, Jason, I'm going to have you take this one that's more traffic related. Can traffic monitoring for the stoplight be expanded down past Shawnee as many backups seem caused by merges versus the stoplight? I'm, I'm going to guess it's where does the monitoring begin on the, on the signal itself? Is it timed or is it monitored? two lanes to one lane and then back to two lanes and then back to one lane. Yeah. <laughs> so the question, the question is, can the traffic monitoring, so would we do, um, so we kind of look at, you know, 500 feet for the back of the queue, but usually we do stop bar detection, right? So right at the signal we see a car and it detects it. And so, you know, that your timer starts to count. And there are some queue overrides, but uh, the way you would do that is we'd have to run fiber to the back of the queue. So I, I don't remember the limits, but it um, sounds, I mean, we can take a look at it. Oh, can I grab that card? Oh, great. Can I ask that? And the most common accidents were, of course, on Pearl Hill, but then um, the most common backup you see is coming from Pimenta Pass. You have coming off Pimenta Pass, you go to two, from two lanes to one, and it start, starts backing up there because nobody plays the zipper gate. And then again in Shawnee, you have the same problem there in Shawnee. Then again, past the high school, you have the same situation. Then coming up Pearl Hill, the most common accident. So just over the years watching the accidents and watching the traffic backups, um, I've been up here for over 20 years, and I have to say that more traffic backups and accidents, rear ending and stuff like that, has occurred with those merges. Merging. Sorry. People don't act that, don't act. Um, I know that in some other states they have like legit points where you can say, start your merge here, and they teach people as they drive how to do the different things. But, it would make more sense instead of just monitoring the traffic light as part of this idea of taking it out <coughs> or leaving it in place, you can monitor farther along the corridor than just the traffic light. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I have two responses to that. Um, 
before Shane was RTD, we did a joint uh, grant where we went after some resiliency funding and freight funding to expand, you know, to kind of get rid of those merging points that we have so far here. Uh, we weren't successful, but we're always keeping a looking out on that. So it is a concern. We would love to get, you know, start to expand a little bit on 285 as much as we can. Um, we try, what well, we, and so she used the term zipper lane. Yep. So, okay, everyone sounds like they're familiar with the term and knows what. We try to implement in our construction projects, and we, we haven't had much success. Um, no, right. You're, oh, you're right on it. So if it's not enforceable, people just don't, you know. Um, yeah, so we've tried it. All right, the question here is, do we have a maintenance schedule for two, uh, Park County at 285? Um, and I believe this is probably a reference to our asphalt and our maintenance of our highways. And yes, we do. We do have a schedule plan. Again, I kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, a resurfacing job that we have planned in calendar year 25, which will be north of Fair Play, um, where it left off the last project about three years ago. And then <clears throat> another resurfacing project that will begin at Bailey and head east, or head east towards the county line um, at, at uh, Pine Junction, and that's planned for calendar year 27. This one is mine. So I'm guessing Marianne might have asked this question. Um, it's a good one. Um, rural counties cannot afford a 50-50 split for funding for transit options. Is there any plan for helping uh, these counties with additional funding for senior transportation specifically? Um, I am concerned, and I'm sure Senator Baisley may want to make a, a comment as well. In parts of the state where we have um, a real desert of healthcare services, senior services, um, we just don't have the infrastructure to provide in communities the types of support that so many of our aging communities need. And I have heard it both here in the Bailey area, but also in Fair Play and Guffey a need for us to explore more partnerships and more opportunities to bring services in, even if it's uh, not on a permanent basis, but to have uh, mobile services or access to, to specific needs for our seniors that we just don't have in our rural areas. So I, I think, and maybe with Senator Baisley's partnership, one of our next town halls will focus on what is available, what's happening at the local level, and how can the state better strengthen the infrastructure around senior services and access. I think that might include um, broadening the topic not only to senior services, but healthcare needs and childcare needs as well, because we know we just don't have so many of those safety net services in our smaller rural communities. Uh, yes, Lisa. I just wanted to add on that point. I think that last two big federal laws have some additional funding for those kinds of services. And it may be that we, CDOT, can help you access some grant funds. Um, I have seen them be pretty good and um, able to help facilitate. They can't make the grant uh, applications for you, but they might be able to point you in the right direction if you have personnel. And so let's have that conversation. That's great. All right. I know there was a question real quick about shouldering and uh, on the long 285 and what's going to be happening here in the near future or anything in the future. I know just uh, north of Pine Junction on that side, they are doing a shouldering project. I don't know how far. It's likely to five to ten miles, but they are doing a shouldering project on that side of, the, of Pine, Pine Junction. We have some additional funding that's available to us around 26, 27, where we will do a project, a safety-oriented project, which could include a shouldering project on 285 as part of one of the things that our team looks at and as to, as to uh, where, where can we get the most bang out of the buck that we have. And so shouldering is an option as well. And so that will be a project um, likely in the future as well. I think we're through most. Okay. Great. This one, um, do you feel like you answered that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 
I just take them on. So, uh, the, the question in uh, summary how will the proposed changes um, with the uh, twin lanes and Bailey affect traffic flow? I already have trouble getting on 25 for a main street. Sorry, thank you. Uh, so the question is, uh, with the, safe, the, the safety project in Bailey and some of the changes we're doing, you know, what's it going to do to traffic flow? Um, and so, uh, you know, when we put the median barrier up, we lost sight distance at a few places because you can't see the approaching car anymore. So there, we had to make some changes there, but we are, uh, I know, kind of the uh, southbound treatment where we did, we went to two to one lanes through the town. Uh, we're going to mimic that going northbound. So I, I know at the lumber yard, you know, you, it used to open up to two lanes. We're going to hold one lane there. And so you're not going to be able to pass until you're outside of town. So uh, traffic will be slower, and we're hoping that we don't get that kind of drag racing effect we're seeing. You know, well, and I, I sympathize because there's not a lot of passing opportunities, you know, up by the school. So... Yeah, but I get it. Um, so we're going to make them go through the town. So we're hoping that we're not going to have this big race to kind of pass whoever. So we're hoping there's going to be create more gaps and traffic will go a lot slower. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask now or not. I actually turn off of 68. And when you put the median barrier in, there'll be a slight problem with the site. Right now I go to church, it takes about five minutes to make a left. During the week, I'm behind the propane trucks because that's what Bailey right. propane is. You gotta put a fire extinguisher there in case it ignites while I'm making a living. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have right hand turn lanes on. They'll be able to see, yeah. but it's hard to make the turn. So we're, yeah, no, Commissioner Mitchell had it right. So we're taking a left turn off of 68 southbound on oh. 285. Oh, gotcha. That's tough. That tough. You, end, you ended your turn lanes, which right. people may be actually using so they, to pass. Yeah. So the and good, then I'm trying yeah. to make left across the, all those lanes. Yeah. And looking at the barrier. So you're in better shape. So the um, Eastern Main Street access, mm -hmm. uh, not Conoco, the other one, that that's the one we were having trouble with the grades. So the County Road and Crow Hill, you know, there's still a grade difference. So you should be able, your sight distance shouldn't be impacted. Um, okay, but, is it possible but, to do two things? Sure. I mean, I can listen. Can you? It's forty going through town. Right. If they load at thirty-five, it gives me a few more seconds to make a left turn. And if they put no parking along that same stretch with the, yep. You said W beam. It's actually three type three truck guardrail. Right. Uh, put no parking there because you can go down there now, and there's a trailer that every weekend parks there now sure. to navigate. I don't use Main Street and I don't use sixty-four. I actually use. It's easier to make a U-turn and not get hit. Right. And that guy parks there. It's a car hole. It's right. there right now. It's United something or other. Mm -hmm. That car hole is there, and you you have a hard time making that U-turn. So if you can if you can post at 35, look at that. I mean, you're the traffic engineer, and if you also can look at posting no parking, because yep. they do it. So we're going to do no parking on both sides. Okay. So that, that is part of the project. Well. Uh, you're talking speed limit. Yeah. I'm trying up fair play. What's the speed limit in fair play? 25? 25. Why can we have a 25 mile an hour speed limit coming through Bailey until you get into the turn going northbound and you're heading toward the fire station southbound? Yeah, it kind of goes back to that federal guidance on how we set <laughs> kind of how we set speed limits in the past. Yeah. Commissioner well, Elsner. Yeah. Fair play, it's 25 on Highway 9. Uh, 285, I believe, is 40. It's 45. 45. Um, and the, one of the main differences is fair play is a municipality. They have a little more to say about what happens in the municipality than the county has on roads in unincorporated counties. Yep. Real quick, when I looked at the plans online for when you're going to fix 
to the bottom curve this summer. Yes. I didn't see anything as you're, so if you're going northbound towards Denver and you're coming up Crow Hill and there's two lanes and the other line of traffic is just one lane and it's coming down, there's a slight curve coming around and it seems, it doesn't seem like there was anything that was going to happen to the ability to pass to make that when you're coming down, but I work in Bailey and live on the mid Crow Hill, and I see it all the time where someone is passing me, and they sh you shouldn't be allowed to pass because the line of sight, the double dotted, the dotted line goes too far. You shouldn't be able to pass that far down Crow Hill because the line of sight is bad, and there's a lot of times people are coming up, and someone's passing, and they're going right into. They can't see what's coming around the corner. Yeah, that's Sorry, a bad I'm not one. explaining myself very no, well. If people who live here know what I'm talking about, yeah. but there should be a double line so much more farther up Crow Hill. Mm -hmm. Not that people may still pass, but they're not, a, shouldn't be allowed to. So, I don't know if that's been looked at, but it didn't seem like it was on those plans. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We'll take a look. It's quite a bit okay. up the hill from the end of the curve. We've talked about it. Can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, twice in the last three months, I've come around the curve coming up the hill, where it's two lanes coming up, mm -hmm. and that one going down, and you come around this curve, and there's someone in my lane, yes. even though I'm, because they're, they're, still they, to they're still allowed to pass, but they can't see that we're coming up the hill, and all of a sudden, there's someone in my lane, and one time I really had to slam on the brakes. It was very scary. It's happened quite often. So that's what she's referring to. Yeah. It just takes a little bit of pain. You have to double yeah. yellow into the state yard from downtown. You'll notice, you'll know what we're talking about if you go down there. No, I know where it's at. Oh, yeah. I think you did. Do you have any time? So one more question here, and um, first of all, thank you all. I know this has been a lot to go through, and we have been jumping around a bit in the community to different projects, different places. Um, I, as a follow-up to today's conversation, we are going to take all of these questions that are on a card. So if you have not written your question on a card, please do so for us. We're going to take all of them. We will compile them. We will run them by CDOT and make sure that folks who are not here tonight have access to those answers. Uh, as Jason had pointed out with the postcards you've all received, that does have specific information on the project. We'll be sure to include that postcard information in our follow-up on questions as well. And I believe this is probably the start of a running dialogue about these projects and next steps. It is February. We're two months away from the advertisement of the Crow Hill project. I want to make sure that we are being responsive to all of you and keeping you up to date on the steps of that project's project and as it moves forward, making sure that the timeline that's established um, is held to as best as possible. Um, I know, and as uh, Shane mentioned earlier, um, because of supply chain challenges and inflationary pressures, we have seen delays on projects. This one doesn't sound like it's, it's being challenged by delays yet, the April start. So I think we're going to be headed off and out of the gate on time. But we want to be sure to monitor that for all of you and follow up with our CDOT representatives whenever we can. I want to take one last question and then also offer that we are here until 5.30 and we can continue our conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for anything we didn't get to, we, we had quite a few that were similar in nature, so we'll be sure to combine those and make sure that we are responsive to all of these in our follow-up. Sir. Yeah, so I just said. One last question. First of all, I'd like to say thank you, um, mm -hmm. House Speaker McCluskey and Senator Basin for coming out on Saturday afternoon to visit with us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the plan that you guys have for a long-term solution is fantastic. It's long overdue and much needed. Um, as you guys saw, we've had now three um, very 
rough ac accidents happen right on that turn. Thankfully, no one has lost a life. I think you guys can wait one. So, no, the drivers and stuff. I apologize. So there, it has been very, it has been tragic and also, um, to say it lightly, a big mess. Okay. Uh, in the interim, before the April project, can you guys, at least in a short-term solution, commit to installing temporary concrete barriers along the, uh, oh, is it the median as well as the uh, next to the winery? I know you guys have a lot of projects going on, but to install maybe a two-day project where you drop some concrete barriers in order to save lives and to mitigate any potential uh, hazards that could happen to our community before this project starts, I think most of the people in this room would greatly appreciate at least a band-aid until April, because we're bound to get a lot more snowstorms and it ain't going to look good. Let me go and talk to my maintenance team and see what we have in hand and what we can do. And so I'll, I'll commit to you with that, uh, and we'll do our best. Um, I think we may have some concrete barrier, but I want to be sure before I commit to anything like that. I don't totally. want to put a false comment out there at all. But I need to talk to my maintenance team. Yeah, if you know, I'm happy to. We could exchange contact information okay. uh, in the oh, yeah. interim, just so we can help work yeah. things through. Because I know you guys have a lot, a lot on your plate. We can also help. One of the challenges the for a temporary, though, could be you know, as they get hit by cars and this, that, and the other, what's going to happen? Are they approaching cars and does it get into another, another line? And so there's some challenges there that I want to think through as well as talk to my, my maintenance team before we commit to something like that. So, yeah, I just don't want to see yeah, another semi go blast. I completely understand that. I appreciate that. I completely understand that. Yes, sir. I um, also want to thank everybody for coming here, especially our our commissioners to attend the meeting is uh, very well regarded. I, we were talking about a little bit of paint. Going northbound, when you top Crow Hill, it changes from two lanes and tells people to merge to the right. And there's an entrance in the grade separated intersection on County Road 72 where people are trying to enter 285 and there is no line of sight to speak of for those people trying to merge. There is no merge lane. And why are you pushing people into the right lane against the people trying to merge versus allowing the left lane to be, make the right lane a merge acceleration lane all the way down to the light? Because all you have is yellow lines pushing everybody together. And the road's there. So I would strongly suggest you get some more paint out and readdress that issue. <laughs> 72 and 285. 72 to it. We'll take a look at that. Okay, let's, let's uh, take a look at this now. Yeah. Go to the underpass over there. Go to the grid separated underpass and try to head northbound. Okay. You'll see, you'll know immediately what I'm talking about. You want to merge the other side of the hill yeah. and then carry the, okay. the northbound on ramp, which I built, clear to the light. Yeah. I, um, I know there are more questions. I've seen three additional hands. Again, I invite you to please put your questions or comments on an index card. Hopefully, we have your contact information out front. Email addresses, if you can share those with us. We will follow up by including these questions on a running dialogue with CDOT. We'll start by getting these down, getting some feedback from CDOT, sharing the postcard information again, and then following up at our next town hall. Um, if you're here tonight, we will email that information out to you so you have it in writing. And we'll also make sure you have contact information for Senator Baisley, myself, and our CDOT liaison. I want, um, I want you all to know that just by your participation tonight, the number of people we have here, the questions that have come up, and I'm certainly reading the concern and the frustration in the room with the transporta transportation challenges we're facing here. You know, the, um, as I said earlier, the infrastructure needs in, the, in this state, have we have not kept pace with solving those needs for years, decades. And in a community like Bailey, where you're starting to see traffic volumes um, that are, are certainly putting stress on that system and design, I, I, I'm hearing you, and I want you to know that there isn't a quick fix. I'm sure that is 
um, apparent just in our conversations tonight, but it doesn't mean we can't start to continue to focus in and ask for commitments from our CDOT partners in the work that we are doing to try and make this community safer and certainly make sure that you can get from point A to point B in a, um, uh, an efficient and effective way. Um, I would invite you all, ask you all, to um, share a round of applause for our guests from CDOT here tonight. Thank you. To our county commissioners, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate that. Monica, thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Um, we will be staying around now for a few minutes, so if you have additional questions, please come chat with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. We will probably be doing a Zoom town hall next, um, just until session is over in early May. It is difficult to get out in the uh, counties uh, any other time except a weekend, so we'll probably be doing Zoom town halls for a bit. Always reach out to my office. My contact information is out on the table. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Speaker McCluskey. Just, uh, this is actually when, uh, and Speaker McCluskey will attest to this as well, when we have gatherings, town halls, we, uh, especially if you're running for an office and, and so on, you don't get this kind of a turnout. So this is, is telling us a lot. This is like double the, the max turnout that you get for a typical campaign. This, you guys are here um, looking out for your community and it does make a lot of sense. So we're hearing you loud and clear, but let me uh, join uh, Speaker McCluskey in just the commitment to make sure that we're doing everything we can from the legislative angle to get the funding to these smart folks that are trying to uh, Shane, uh, to uh, do the job for you and something that is our responsibility as a state. So anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for letting us know um, how you feel and your smart suggestions. And um, we'll just do our best and communicate frequently and be here as often as we can. So thank you. Thank you.